Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's webcast, Exposing Risk in Your Electrical Safety Program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Vavra, Content Manager for Plant Engineering, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Plant Engineering and CFE Media for what we know is going to be a great afternoon of knowledge. Plant Engineering has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RCEP at rcep.net. A certificate of completion will be issued to each participant. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed by RCEP to be an approval or endorsement. Ensuring the prevention of injuries from electrical hazards involves continual assessment of risk and effectiveness of your electrical safety program. Are you aware of the latest developments in regulation, code, standards, and technology impacting your program? Do you know who's at risk of injury? And what's the best measure of effectiveness of your program? Whether you're just starting to develop or have a mature and robust electrical safety program, today's webcast will help you identify gaps and opportunities for improvement in prevention of electrical shock and arc flash hazards. Among our learning objectives for today, we'll be describing the top three scenarios for exposure to hazardous electrical energy. We'll be describing the categories of workers exposed to hazardous electrical energy. We'll apply the OSHA recommendations for safety and health programs to identify gaps in electrical safety programs. And we'll look at some of the leading indicator metrics for prevention of electrical injuries. This afternoon's event is a live educational webcast presented on June 11, 2019. And the educational category is technical, health, and safety. Here's some tips to help you get the most out of today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, Click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box, and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. You can type questions for our speaker in the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of your screen, and the Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of this presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Those documents also will be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. We couldn't be happier to have our good friend and uh, the guy I consider to be the leading expert on electrical safety uh, in the country to be uh, working with us today. Uh, Lanny Floyd is a life fellow at IEEE. He's the owner uh, of Electrical Safety Group, Inc., and he's a member of the Plan Engineering Editorial Advisory Board. Lanny's also an adjunct professor in the Advanced Safety and Engineering Management Graduate Engineering Program at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He retired from DuPont in 2014 after a 45-year career devoted to the prevention of electrical injuries and fatalities. These are always tremendous webcasts with a tremendous amount of information. Our attendees today are in for a great treat. And uh, without further ado, uh, your presenter for this afternoon, Lanny Floyd. Lanny? Oh, thank you, Bob. I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share some of my experiences with the uh, with your audience today. I, uh, I I really appreciate the fact that Plan Engineering has been such a uh, strong advocate for bringing knowledge and education to plan engineers and uh, the members of the Plan Engineering magazine community. As um, as Bob uh, mentioned uh, in my introduction. Uh, I worked for the DuPont company for 45 years. And most of that time, most of that 45 years, I was focused on how can we uh, in, improve our electrical safety program that we use throughout, our, uh, throughout the company. Uh, during my career with DuPont, we had a workforce of about 100,000 employees and contractors uh, working out at about 150 industrial and uh, manufacturing sites in close to 80 countries around the world. So we had a very diverse exposure to electrical hazards, uh, different types of work environments, different countries, uh, uh, different national standards and that sort of thing. But what we were able to do is have a very uh, uh, common electrical safety 
management system that we used in, in, on all of our operations. Uh, that particularly came to fruition in the mid-1980s. Uh, in this chart, uh, I'm very proud of the, of the results that we were able to achieve in, in DuPont in bringing attention to uh, risk of electrical injury and, and putting in place some very robust um, practices and systems to, uh, to assure that, that all of our workforce and our contractors were um, up to speed on understanding uh, electrical hazards and the risk of electrical injury. Now, in this chart in the center, uh, it just shows a trend of uh, the electrical injuries, or I'm sorry, electrical fatalities from 1940 to uh, to recent years. And you can see in the in, when I started with Dupont in the in the late 60s and through the 70s and 80s, we were experiencing an electrical fatality about one every 33 months in our global operations. Again, for a workforce of about 100,000 people, that was industry average uh, at that time, um, in that period of time. Um, now, DuPont was a world-class leader in safety, and when we realized that we were only average in preventing electrical injuries and electrical fatalities, uh, I was very privileged to work with a, a group of people who felt that we could make a difference, and that wasn't, uh, that wasn't satisfactory. So we worked very hard. We engaged man management support, engaged our workforce, not just our electrical workers, but all of our uh, employees and contractors we worked very diligently with to change how they viewed the risk of electrical injuries and fatalities. And you can see uh, in, the, in the bottom two lines there, in my first 25 years with my career in DuPont, we had 12 electrocution fatalities. In my last 20 years, we had zero. So we, again, we have results that demonstrate that the work that we did to change how we thought about uh, electrical hazards and the risk of injury from those hazards had a big impact in helping us achieve breakthrough uh, performance improvement. Now, what I'd like to do today is just spend uh, a little over a half hour talking about some of the lessons that I learned uh, in that, in that, over that period of time in how we viewed risk of electrical injury. So here's the agenda. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, what's it, what do we mean by compliance-based approach to electrical, uh, to safety management versus a risk-based safety culture. Talk, we'll talk a few minutes about that. And then I'm gonna talk about, uh, about five, I'll call common traps, uh, pitfalls, where you can, uh, expose risk that you may not be aware that you had. And then you can work to reduce that. Maybe you can um, um, prioritize or, or change how you approach certain things. So again, no matter where you are on your program, whether you are just getting started, whether you're, you're halfway there, or you feel you have a very mature electrical safety program, uh, one of the key things about a risk-based approach to safety is that you're ne never satisfied with where you are. You're always looking for uh, risk that may be hidden or uh, uh, undiscovered in the past. So let's get started. Uh, some of the common risk traps. Well, the reason we want to do that, if you look at what OSHA has said over the last decade, uh, this is a, a statement from the Assistant Secretary David Michaels uh, this was a communication to the OSHA staff back in July of 2010. And in the letter, he had this statement. He said that ensuring that American workplaces are safe will require a paradigm shift, with employers going beyond simply attempting to meet OSHA standards to implementing risk-based workplace injury and illness prevention programs. So that's a, a recognition that just being in compliance with laws and regulations, codes, and standards isn't enough. In order to really achieve a maximum um, potential or maximum um, ability to prevent injuries and fatalities requires this risk-based approach that is about constantly looking for risk and putting in place programs or, or interventions to reduce that risk. 
You're never satisfied. Uh, one of the things OSHA has done recently is in 2016, they updated the 1989 uh, guidance uh, for uh, safety and health programs. In 2016, they published uh, this, this booklet. But more than the booklet, there's an entire website dedicated to helping uh, employers and workers understand how to uh, uh, continually assess their safety programs uh, and to look for uh, opportunities to improve it. Now, the 2016 update did some things to align the original 1989 guidance to conform with safety management standards that have been published uh, since 1989. That included ANSI Z10, that's the American National Standard for Occupational Safety and Health Management Systems. That was published in 2005. OSAS 18001 is based on a British standard um, that was first published, I think, uh, in the early 90s. Military Standard 882 is the safety management system standard that uh, much of the military and Department of Defense use. Uh, many defense contractors, because they're aligned with the, their military counterparts, also use uh, 882 as their safety management standard. Uh, that's one of the oldest safety management standards, by the way. It was first published in 1969. And it's been updated a number of versions. Version E is a reflects the uh, revisions uh, since the original publication. Most recently, uh, the uh, ISO 45001, which has also been adopted by ANSI, it was uh, published in 2018, just uh, last year. Now, the reason OSHA published this document, recommendation, Recommended Practices for Safety and Health Programs, is that these other safety management uh, standards really uh, for the most part, require competency in safety management systems. In other words, a dedicated safety professional that are educated and certified in, uh, in understanding what we mean by safety management systems. And so the, uh, this uh, document and the resources on the uh, accompanying website target small companies with limited safety management resources. So it's written in a much easier to read uh, 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 method and uh, also provides guidance that are that in, in language that is more uh, user friendly rather than just the standard uh, standard based language approach. So again, a very significant uh, resource from OSHA. Again, supporting the uh, the focus on shifting our culture not to be just in compliance with standards, but also to, to have a very risk-based approach. So if we look at the trend in electrical fatalities in the U.S. Uh, from, uh, this goes back to the uh, around late, early 80s, I believe, to uh, recent years, we can see that over the years we've, we see a, uh, a, a downward trend, which is very good. Uh, there have been ups and downs. Some of that is due to uh, the economy, uh, whether we're having a lot of uh, construction work activity going on or we're in a recession and, uh, and uh, a lot of work is, uh, is uh, being postponed or, or, um, or uh, deferred. So the question is, how good is this? Is, th are we, is that good enough? If we look at recent years, uh, this is from 2000 and 2016, looking at the trend in occupational fatalities in the U.S. We can see it's, it's very flat uh, when we look at the detail. So there's one of the concerns uh, with uh, in safety management today in the U.S. is that not just in electrical safety, but in all hazards in the workplace, the trend in fatality prevention has flattened significantly. So there's been a lot of questions raised, uh, and what can we do differently to uh, to change this? Can we can we get even lower? Well, that's to answer that question, we need to look outside the U.S. and look at how other countries are uh, managing risk from occupational hazards in the workplace. And we see that uh, in Europe, 
the uh, fatality rate in, in uh, workplace safety is significantly less than it is in the U.S. In fact, for what I have uh, outlined in red here on the chart on the right is um, uh, the fatality rates from contact with electrical energy. And the, the U.S. fatality rate is 3.8 times greater than it is in the U.K., and is greater than it is for uh, most of the Western European Union countries. Now, this data came from the uh, the paper there showed on the left the occupation occupation excuse me occupational fatality risk uh, in the United States and the United Kingdom. This was published in 2014, so this is fairly recent data, uh, helping us understand that there may be opportunity for us to improve um, not just electrical safety, but uh, uh, fatality, occupational fatalities in a broad sense here in the U.S. Now, why are they different? Well, Fred Manuel, who's the photograph here on the right, is one of the leading authorities in safety in the world today. He's based in the U.S., and he had this quote in a recent article that he uh, published. He said that the risk assessment is the cornerstone of the European approach to prevent occupational accidents and ill health. If the risk assessment process, the start of the health and safety management approach, is not done well or not done at all, the appropriate measures are unlikely to be identified or put in place. Now, tie Fred's uh, quote here with what we saw from Director Michaels just a few slides earlier, where Director Michaels was saying uh, that in order to improve occupational safety in the U.S., we need to shift more towards a risk-based approach. Again, we've seen the results in, in Europe, in the European Union. So what's the difference between U.S. and U.K.? Now, this, now, the answer is not this simple. This is a very simple illustration, but if you look in, um, if you could boil it down to just a few words. Here we see a collage in the center. Uh, these are codes, regulations, and standards that most of us should be very familiar with related to electrical safety. We have OSHA regulations. We have the National Electrical Code. We have the National Electrical Safety Code. We have NFPA 70B, which is on maintenance. We have uh, IEEE 1584, which is the arc flash hazard uh, assessment uh, protocol. We have IEEE standards on maintenance and safety. And we have NFPA 70, which is a, a premier standard on workplace safety uh, in the U.S. and other countries around the world. So we see a little character on the left-hand side and the American flag, and he's representing an American worker. He's saying, I follow the rules. I know what the rules are, and I follow the rules. The character on the right has his magnifying glasses, and he's adding a perspective from the U.K. He says, yeah, that's, we need to do that. We need to follow the rules, but I also look for risk. After we comply with the laws and regulations, have we missed anything? Or is, is my workplace environment, do we have risk that the codes and regulations maybe don't quite uh, cover as, they, as we would like for them to? So let's get into uh, some of the uh, opportunities to expose risk in our electrical safety programs. Here are three questions. Who are the workers at risk from electrical hazards? Does your electrical safety program cover all those workers? And what are the workplace scenarios with the highest risk? We'll look at these three questions first. So who's at risk? Well, we see in the photograph here electrical workers who are working on or near hazardous electrical equipment and systems. They certainly are at risk. But there are other workers. So here we see in this photograph, uh, we have a crew that's moving a large piece of equipment down a public highway. And we're coming in contact unintentionally with an overhead power line. So we have uh, uh, workers who may be coming in uh, contact with overhead power lines, and that could be crane operators, truck drivers, agricultural workers, uh, scaffold erectors. Uh, the list goes on and on. We'll get into a little more of that in a few minutes. And in this photograph, we have a groundskeeper, a landscaper, using an electrically powered uh, leaf shredder. So he's representing workers who use portable electrically powered tools. When you think about who in the workplace uses portable electrically powered tools, 
that's a lot of that could be a lot of people, especially if you consider appliances and other cord connected uh, uh, devices that are common in workplace. That includes things in your office. It could be out on the manufacturing shop floor. Uh, it could be anywhere out on the construction site. And then we have a group of people that are exposed to unguarded electrical energy. And we have a photograph here of, a, of an electrical panel with the cover off. Well, that could be an electrical outlet with the cover off or the cover broken. Or it could be an appliance with an access cover loose or missing. So we have, we have workers, employees who are exposed to unguarded electrical energy. So who's at risk? What I've seen uh, a common pitfall is that uh, organizations have de designed their electrical safety program around electrical workers. The workers who work, whose job description calls out for them to be working on or near hazardous electrical energy. Well, that certainly is one group of employees that are exposed. But then we have a whole list of others we live in an electrical world today. Everything we do utilizes electricity and electrical energy in some form. We have uh, lines, power lines, cords, wires, equipment all around us. So we have construction laborers, groundskeepers and landscapers, truck drivers, crane operators, painters, farm workers, managers and supervisors, and the list just goes on and on. Almost everybody in the workforce today to some degree, has exposure to electrical hazards. Certainly, it's different from, from uh, 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 the, depending on your job activity or job description. Certainly, people who work in an office don't need, don't need to be trained on uh, perhaps arc flash hazards, but they do need to be aware and trained on hazards associated with cord-powered equipment. Okay? Okay, here's another trap. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, many organizations uh, transfer their, most of their risk to electrical hazards to competent and qualified contractors. If you have an organization where you're focused on a particular business uh, operation and electrical maintenance or electrical construction is not your expertise, then it's not uncommon for organizations to contract that out. But you need to be careful and don't fall into the trap where you think that we don't do electrical work. Let's look at the, some of the details here. Fifty percent of the fatalities in the U.S. from contact with exposure to electrical energy involve contact with overhead power lines. Most of the victims are not electricians or linemen. And we saw that list uh, a little bit earlier. We have uh, carpenters, painters, window washers, crane operators, truck drivers, people carrying ladders, people carrying conductive long pieces or conductive parts, such as uh, uh, metal siding or, or gutter or, or other roofing materials. Uh, we have uh, anything that can be, that's conductive that could, could come in contact in, to an overhead power line, whether it's a, something portable like a piece of pipe or something mo uh, like mobile equipment, like a train, a uh, crane, or or a truck. Uh, so we have that. So even if you're contracting out your electrical maintenance construction, you may still have some exposure to overhead power lines. Now, about 35 percent of the fatalities in the U.S. come uh, from electrical hazards, uh, from contact with or exposure to electrical energy, involve workers whose job responsibilities include working on or near unguarded, energized conductors and parts. And that's typically the, uh, the workers that we call electricians or alignment or electrical technicians or something along that. That's about 35%. So 65% of the fatalities and injuries fall outside that job description. So again, you need to think about what exactly if you, are we really doing, if we don't do electrical work, do we still have electrical exposure? Now, about 15% of the fatalities come from contact with or exposure to electrical energy involving workers using cord power tools and appliances and temporary extension cords. That can be out on a construction site. That could be uh, uh, maintenance workers. Uh, that could be uh, cord-powered equipment in your vending area or your lunchroom. It could be cord-powered equipment and tools in your office. 
uh, or in the shop or or anywhere. So again, uh, there may there may be risk associated with that. And even if um, looking at it a little bit broader, about 24% of industrial fires are attributed to faulty wiring or faulty electrical equipment. So don't fall into the trap of saying, well, we don't do electrical work, therefore we don't have any exposure to electrical hazards. You likely do. You need to think about what is your risk. Now, one of the most important safe work practices when working on or near energized electrical equipment is to establish an electrically safe work condition. And that's when you identify the sources of power uh, operate uh, isolation devices, lock them out, verify isolation with testing and so forth, and uh, and you may even apply temporary grounds if, on, on certain equipment. So what I've shown here on this slide, in the center is I'll, the, the little character holding a plug. That's representing an electrical worker, a worker that's the electrical safe work condition has been established but we need to be careful. There may still be risk. Now, it, I've, I've put three of these um, uh, words or groups of words in red, and that's for a reason, because they are sources of electrical energy, even though you may have an electrically safe work condition. For example, in the upper right, on the line side of each of the isolation devices, there is likely electrical energy. We need to be aware of that. We need to be conscious of that. We need to make sure that we stay sufficient distance away from that so that we don't get tangled up in energized uh, line sight. And I've seen many accidents where, unfortunately, due to the distractions uh, listed in these other words around the, this guy, we end up making a mistake. Now, the other two um, terms that are in red text, uh, down at the very bottom, uh, we have nearby circuits. Even though your circuit you're working on may be in an electrically safe work condition, there may be other circuits nearby, maybe outside the uh, restricted approach boundary, but uh, are, are, is nearby and could present a risk to, to a workers if we forget where the safe work boundary is. And the other uh, term I have over in the lower left are covers and shutters. This is covers on electrical equipment, so maybe switch gear. Uh, it could be shutters. Shutters are commonly used in draw-out circuit breakers, uh, low-voltage and medium-voltage circuit breakers. And so there may be energy, hazardous energy, behind covers and behind shutters, and we need to be aware that uh, to make sure that we understand that we can't take off any covers or raise or open any shutters that could expose workers to electrical hazards. Because if, uh, if you were to open a door or remove a cover or lift a shutter, you're immediately in uh, very close proximity to hazardous electrical energy. So in these other terms around here, I won't read them all, but these are things that contribute to people making a mistake. Time pressure poor lighting, poor workspace, weather conditions, with the cell phone rings. Uh, we have improper tools. We have PPE that's limiting our dexterity or visibility. Maybe, we're, maybe the equipment is damaged. Maybe the drawings are incorrect. Maybe uh, we have personal health issues. Maybe there's a tripping hazard. Maybe labels are missing. Um, those are some of the things and this, uh, the, the terms I have listed around here are just some of the terms, some of the things that contribute to enabling a person to make a mistake and, and maybe allowing them to drift into a danger zone, even if you have an electrical safe work condition established. So you need to look at that. You need, any time that you have an electrical safe work condition, you need to make sure people understand the boundary and you think about what could – what could uh, uh, enable a person to get outside that boundary and put in some, put in some interventions to, to reduce that likelihood. Uh, here's another trap. Uh, we've never had an electrical injury here. Well, that's not too unusual. Uh, if in this pie chart, 
Um, we have a pie chart showing uh, non-fatal lost time injuries in the U.S. Uh, uh, this is a, from a year, uh, a year, uh, some few years ago, but um, we see that the large uh, segment there, one third, are sprains, strains, and tears. These are non-fatal lost time injuries, so a person requiring hospital treatment. At, down at the bottom, we have musculoskeletal disorders, about a quarter of the total lost time injuries in the U.S. And then in the, over on the right in the green, we have falls on the same level. Someone, for example, trips on a carpet or trips on a cord and falls on the floor. They're falling on the same level. That's, those three hazards alone account for about uh, three-fourths, 75% of all the lost time injuries uh, that occur each year in the U.S. At the very top, you can't even make it out in this chart. There's a tiny sliver of red, and that is the electrical shock and burn injuries, arc flash burns and electrical shock burns, non-fatal, that occur in the U.S. each year, less than two-tenths of one percent. So if you feel like you haven't had an electrical injury in memory or in a long time, uh, it may or may not be due to the quality of your electrical safety program. It may be due to the fact that these just don't happen very often, okay? And so don't get caught into the trap that we've never had an electrical injury, therefore we must be really good at preventing them. That may not be true. Electrical injuries are very, very low frequency. About one out of every 500 lost time injuries is uh, an electrical injury. So if you look at the number of lost time injuries you have in your organization each year, and think about one of one out of 500 would be a lost time injury. Then you can understand why maybe we haven't why we haven't had one in a long time. But they are very high consequence. There are very few minor injuries involving contact with electrical energy. Uh, about one in 13 uh, lost time injuries uh, from electrical exposure is fatal. Currently in the U.S. is the sixth leading cause of occupational fatality. And if you're in the construction industry or if you have construction contractors working in your business or your facility, uh, building a new project or whatever, you need to be aware that uh, contact with electrical injury is the second leading cause of fatality in construction. So if you've never had one, don't wait for the first one before you get the motivation to prevent the next one. You need to prevent the first one. All right. Again, that's a very significant risk, is thinking that we've never had one, so we must be in good shape. Okay, another risk, another pitfall, is the failure to integrate the relevant codes, regulations, and standards into your own unique, customized electrical safety program that you use in your facility or your company or your organization. The, the pitfall that I see many people do is think, oh, uh, we, we comply with all OSHA regulations, or we use NFPA 70E for electrical safety program. The regulations and the standards are not an electrical safety program by themselves. They are there to provide you guidance on what your program needs to contain, and it's more than just what's in any one code, regulation, or standard. Here I'm, I'm showing, again, that collage of of OSHA regulations, the National Electrical Code, which covers the requir minimum requirements for installation. Uh, if you have overhead power lines uh, on or near or around your facility, uh, the National Electrical Safety Code is a regulation that uh, is relevant. You have the IEEE 1584, the guidelines for conducting arc flash risk assessments. We have a IEEE standards on maintenance and safety for industrial and commercial power systems. We have NFPA 70E, well, again, a very prominent standard in, in, in workplace electrical safety. They are provide the input that you need to incorporate into your electrical safety program. And this is where I see many organizations um, fall short. You just can't say that our, our program is a standard like 70E or or uh, OSHA regulations. The, those guide, those uh, regulations, codes, and standards 
provide the minimum requirements. You need to take those minimum requirements and integrate it into your own electrical safety program. Uh, I think this is the last pitfall that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I've got several slides on this. And this is a failure to, uh, or, or missing the boat in the evolution in inherently safer technology. Now, the first slide here is a rather extreme example because in, in the photograph on the left-hand side, we see a uh, live front unenclosed switchboard, which is common uh, and standard uh, at least through the 1920s. Uh, some of these were installed even later in, in the U.S. and other parts of the world. And we see a worker standing in front of it. And so that worker's safety is dependent on them knowing what not to touch on the front of that panel board because there are live conductors, switches, fuse blocks, terminals on that uh, switchboard. Now, over on the right-hand side, we have a more modern dead front enclosed switch gear. Much of the equipment that we install today is fully enclosed, and as long as the doors are closed, covers are on, uh, and, uh, most workers are not exposed to electrical hazards. So we have, a, again, a compare, an illustration here that shows that technology has changed during the 20th century and going, going into the 21st century to reduce the risk of, a, uh, of exposure to electrical energy. Now, electrical equipment, much of the industrial and commercial equipment stays around for a long time. It's not unusual for switchgear or transformers, uh, motor control centers, switches to be around for 20, 30 years. Uh, during that time, the evolution in inherently safer technology has marched forward. And if your equipment, your equipment that you have installed may not have all of the inherently safer design that you could achieve today if you were to install it today. So there is an opportunity to reduce risk. Are you, is there risk that you uh, could is there significant risk if you reduce uh, through uh, uh, better, more modern technology? And I've got a couple examples here. Now, most of us have lived, at least I remember, back before 1962. Many of you on the webcast today are, uh, don't date back that long, I know. But uh, prior to 1962 in the U.S., uh, the outlets that we had in our homes, in our businesses, and in many industrial facilities were the two wire, two slots here that are seen on the left. In 1962, the National Electrical Code uh, uh, made it uh, codified the requirement to that all new outlets have the equipment ground, the third wire, uh, and that is to assure that everything that's plugged into that outlet, that if it had a metal case, that the metal case of the portable tool or appliance was grounded so that if you had a failure of insulation, the the uh, case would not become energized and someone could be electrocuted just by touching the case of an appliance or a tool. Now, in 1970, that technology was raised to an even higher level with the introduction and requirements for ground fault circuit interrupter outlets and uh, circuit breakers that followed. Today, we have other technology that uh, looks at different hazards, such as the arc, fault, arc fault circuit interrupter uh, outlets and breakers. So again, these are representative of, of the evolution. If you look hard in some organizations and facilities, you will find opportunities to improve the equipment grounding protection, either through uh, the three-wire grounded outlets or the GFC outlets. Uh, and uh, there are still opportunities uh, in older facilities to do that. The code doesn't require it. The OSHA does not require that you update to meet the current code, but the opportunity is there if you see that you have risk that you want to reduce. Related to that is the evolution in uh, double insulated uh, tools. On the right-hand side is a um, right-angle drill uh, that is a has a insulated case. Uh, this was uh, purchased about 2014. 
has a non-conductive case. It does not have the three-wire grounded because it's not necessary because the if you have an insulation failure inside the tool in the motor or in the switching uh, uh, mechanism, uh, the insulated case prevents the energy from coming in contact with the person who would be holding this tool in their hand. Uh, that's compared to the very similar tool on the left-hand side. Uh, this one was purchased in 1974. It has a conductive metal case and a three-wire cord. Now, uh, if the three-wire cord is plugged into a three-wire outlet and, and everything is intact, there's no broken uh, gr uh, equipment ground, uh, the three-wire outlet has been installed properly, if you have a failure in the insulation inside the tool, then the uh, cases will be grounded and so you're not exposed to electrical energy. However, if you have a failure in the cord, if the equipment ground is broken, if the third uh, equipment ground prong is broken off, if it's plugged into an extension cord that has a defective equipment ground, either a broken wire or a broken off prong, then that safety feature does not exist and you could be exposed to a serious electrical a shock incident. So the the newer uh, non-conductive double insulated uh, uh, tool on the right hand side, the yellow one, is an example of the continuing evolution in inherently safer technology. Uh, here we see a comparison of the cord uh, plug on the end of a of a cord connected piece of equipment. Uh, in both of the uh, photographs, the the uh, plug in the top left is from the 1950s. Uh, there's no, um, you see exposed wires on the screw terminals there. Uh, you can see the where on the right hand photograph, you can see how the fingers are touching the uh, plug in. And so the fingers are much closer to energized parts than they are in the uh, more modern plug that's in the lower right in both of these photographs. So again, example of inherently sacred technology. Do you have any old equipment laying around? Do you have any equipment with old cords and old plugs that maybe don't have uh, these features built into it? May may be an opportunity. Well, here's one more. This this involving this is illustrating some of the uh, smart equipment that's available today. Motor control centers, substations, switchgear are are available today that have communications technology. So that instead of troubleshooting in a traditional way, like the two electricians dressed out in arc flash and shock protective, uh, protective equipment there on the right, they're doing uh, troubleshooting in a motor starter. The uh, technician on the left, in the left photograph, is doing basically the same troubleshooting technique. Uh, he's obtaining the similar information, but he's using his laptop plugged into an ethernet connection in the front of the motor control center. So he's doing the same type of troubleshooting but without exposure to hazardous electrical energy. So again, an example of the evolution in inherently safer technology. Uh, here's one more. This is a, uh, comparing two different fuse blocks. These are uh, 250 volt fuses. Uh, the fuse block on the left is a more traditional design. It's been around for a long time, very common. Uh, you can see the energized parts are fully exposed. Uh, the fuse ferrules, uh, fuse clips are, are there. You have to be careful when you're working around this. You have to be careful and don't touch it, all right? The fuse block on the right is designed uh, with all the energized parts shrouded or covered so that uh, if you were working on or near that fuse block, or if you even wanted to change a fuse, replace a fuse, it can be done without exposure to electrical hazards, all right? Again, so the question here, which fuse holder is more effective in reducing the likelihood of an electric shock during routine maintenance for the lifetime? This could be in place for 25, 30, 40, maybe even longer, uh, uh, 40 years or longer. This is an example of inherently safer technology that was uh, required in the 2008 National Electrical Code. And this had to do with uh, reducing the risk of disconnecting ballast in uh, fluorescent light fixtures or other uh, fixtures that were luminaires that had ballast type of uh, devices that may need replacement from time to time. Uh, the requirement is the in the upper right hand corner of, the, of this photograph are the touch safe 
disconnect device uh, that allows uh, a, an electrician to disconnect the ballast without having to turn off the power to the circuit. Um, and that was the, pro the challenge that, we were, that, uh, that was uh, being faced prior to this requirement, that too often people were making the decision to, to disconnect the twist-on wire connectors, as we see in the lower right photograph, without disconnecting, uh, without de-energizing the circuit, just being very careful to not touch anything energized. That works a lot of times. Unfortunately, for many, a number of electricians, it did not work. And so the touch safe disconnect is an example of inherently safer technology. So, in recap, uh, again, this has been uh, just a few of the traps that, uh, that I've seen over the years that, you know, you could ask, do we have these in, a, in our organization? Does our electrical safety program address these traps? Are we Conf confident that they do. I uh, talked about the excluded workers, failure to integrate codes and standards, uh, the belief that we don't do electrical work, uh, the trap of thinking that we've never had an electrical injury, so we must be really good at preventing injuries, and also the last one I just covered, missing the boat and, and the ongoing evolution an inherently safer technology that reduces the risk of exposure to electrical hazards. I'd like to leave you with this quote. It's from Warren Bennis, who's a management consultant. When you're thinking about uh, what do we need to do differently in our electrical safety program, we need to be careful. Don't go with the herd mentality uh, just because everybody's doing it this way doesn't necessarily mean it is the right way or the best way. Here's what Warren Bennis said, and he wasn't talking about electrical safety. He was just talking about excellence in general. He said, excellence is a better teacher than mediocrity. The lessons of the ordinary are everywhere. Truly profound and original insights are to be found only in studying the exemplary. So when, uh, when you're thinking about uh, working on improving your electrical safety program, I would urge you to be careful and make sure that you're looking in examples and resources that are truly uh, 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 extraordinary, the exemplary. Some resources that can help you do that. Again, I mentioned the, the recently published OSHA resource on recommended practice for safety and health programs. There's nothing in this, in these, uh, in this uh, that is specific to electrical safety, but it is the underlying framework for managing and uh, reducing risk in the workplace. Again, it's, uh, you can Google, uh, do, do an internet search for OSHA recommended practice for safety and health programs, and you'll not only get this publication, but you'll get to their website that has a wealth of information that can help you uh, look for opportunities to reduce risk in your operations. Uh, I have been attending the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop for the past 26 years. Um, it is a forum that is focused solely on advancing the practice of electrical safety and advancing the electrical safety culture. Many of the, of the improvements uh, in advancing inherently separate, safer technology has uh, grown out of discussions and conversations that occur at this workshop. Many of the uh, latest uh, technology from equipment manufacturers are, are introduced uh, at this workshop. It's just a uh, forum for um, learning from others. And uh, the next one is coming up in March of uh, 2020 in Reno, Nevada. So if you're interested, just do an internet search for ESW 2020. And the Electrical Safety Foundation International has a wealth of information to help you educate not just workers, but management, supervision, safety professionals, your training uh, staff on electrical safety, electrical safety hazards, electrical safety risk. Uh, there are videos, posters, booklets, brochures, and most of that is free. Uh, unless you're ordering quantity, then you may have to pay a nominal charge, but most of the information is avail available uh, just as a download. Uh, a great way to, 
to boost your knowledge around uh, electrical safety. So uh, that was my last slide. So, Bob, I'll turn it over to you, and I think we may have some questions. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lanny, and it's always a great presentation, and we're looking forward to getting to some of those questions. Uh, if you've got questions for Lanny, type them uh, in the ask question box on your screen, and the questions we don't get to today will be answered via email within a week. And uh, to download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of Lanny's presentation, use the event resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. At the end of our uh, webcast, we'll uh, have an exit survey that'll pop up on your screen. Uh, please take a moment to fill that out as we use the answers to help make improvements to our webcast program. Within seven days, an archive of uh, this webcast with a Q&A will be posted at planengineering.com. You'll be able to, you'll get an email uh, as a registered attendee with a hyperlink to that archive version. You can also access the webcast and all of the webcasts that Plan Engineering produces uh, on our homepage at planengineering.com. And for continuing education on a variety of topics, including electrical safety, visit CFEEDU at CFEEDU.CFEMedia.com. So let's get to a few of uh, the questions here uh, this afternoon. Uh, let's, you, you talked about the differences kind of between the, the uh, U.S. and the U.K. and, and more of a risk analysis in, in the U.K. What do you, what do you mean by risk-based safety culture? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. A risk-based, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a risk-based approach is not about accepting risk, but it's about identifying and reducing risk. In other words, as I, as I illustrate or hopefully I pointed out, you know, you can comply with the laws and regulations. But even if you do that, there may still be opportunities to further reduce risk from uh, exposure to electrical hazards. And so it's about not being satisfied that just that doing the minimum is good enough, but it's about continually looking for opportunities to reduce risk. Um, that's a very simple uh, description. Uh, in practice, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Um, let, let's talk about, we, we talked a great deal about codes and standards. What were some of uh, the top uh, code changes uh, last year uh, in NFPA 70E and uh, how, did, how does the, the code enforcement and the code process, which is a continuing effort, it's not, it doesn't stop just in one year, but how, what are some of the key code changes and, and, and how What's a practical way to stay on top of this and also to start to implement some of these within your facility? Well, uh, certainly one of the uh, changes that has occurred in 70E over the last two cycles has been the enhanced focus on conducting risk assessments. And that's a part of a risk-based approach. Uh, the risk assessment, uh, whether it's conducted uh, uh, very broadly by the employer uh, to look at uh, risk of exposure to electrical hazards in the workplace, or it's done by the worker who's standing a piece of, uh, in front of a piece of switch gear and want to make sure they understand what are, where are the hazards in this gear and what do I need to be doing to, to reduce my risk and control my risk while I'm doing my work today. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that, those are all part of it. Now, the, one of the questions I saw was, does OSHA require us to do risk uh, assessments? Um, that's a bit of a fuzzy answer on that one. Uh, if you look at the uh, underlying fundamental objective uh, requirement from OSHA, the general duty clause, and that is that the worker, that the employer is required to identify and reduce risk uh, in the workplace to uh, provide a workplace that is as free of, of hazards as possible. Certainly reducing risk to zero is not possible. Uh, there's always risk associated with anything we do. Um, our, our, our goal is to reduce it to as low as, as we can, as low as uh, acceptable. And, um, and that, that's what OSHA requires uh, in the general duty clause. Uh, many people, uh, unfortunately, uh, think that just to being in compliance with the safe work practices of uh, 
for example, the electrical safety work practices and so part S, or you look at other hazards in the workplace. Just being in compliance with the law uh, isn't good enough. An example, a corollary would be driving down the highway. Just being in compliance with the speed limit is not enough. We've got to be concerned about the uh, it, has my vehicle been properly maintained? What's my competency as a driver? What's the competency of everybody else on the road? I mean, those are those issues. That's that's beyond the regulatory requirements. Okay, again, that's a that could go on for a long time talking about that, but that's a that's a a, a brief answer there. Yeah, but and Lanny, we've talked about this on many occasions. The 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 short way of saying all that is that you can. Do all the risk assessments you want, but you can't uh, uh, you can't legislate stupid, and you can't let legislate careless, and you can't legislate that things break sometimes. Well, that is true. Uh, uh, that is true, and some, sometimes we get in. A, we feel that if we're in compliance with the law, it's an illusion that that uh, we've done everything that we need to do to protect ourselves or protect our workers. And it's a continuing training process. It's a continuing awareness process, and uh, right. and something that we've we've talked about for a long time in this area. We've got a question in from Jim Walker at uh, Simpson Lumber. Uh, what are the opportunities available to improve grounding in industrial facilities with 480 Delta electrical distribution and equipment? Well, uh, well. Uh, 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 I'm assuming that we're talking about 40 volt, 480 volt delta secondary, mm -hmm. that it may be ungrounded. Uh, you know, there are opportunities to, um, to well, let me back up. The ungrounded delta systems were, were common back in the nine, up through the 1950s. Uh, it was thought that the, that would uh, not only improve safe or have it be safe, but also improve, uh, get, achieve the reliability of your operations. The uh, experience with the ungrounded systems uh, found that uh, they weren't as reliable as we perhaps thought they were, and it created some other uh, operating difficulties. I won't go into the details of that, but the grounded uh, delta and, gr and grounded Y, uh, center grounded Y, became the standard in the 70s, 80s, and through the day. What is becoming more common today is high resistance grounding, and that can be done on um, y uh, center grounded uh, Y systems on some of them. Uh, there are some issues that you have to avoid around uh, line to ground uh, loads, and also on the. But going to the question on the delta grounded uh, or the delta 480 volt systems, uh, there is some technology that you can use to create a grounding point uh, for those uh, delta systems. I will work closely with a uh, one of the the big uh, well. I would work closely with a knowledgeable uh, supplier, either the manufacturer of, of uh, switchgear and uh, uh, equipment, or engineering services that are competent in in uh, industrial power system design. Uh, there are solutions to that issue that can improve safety and reliability. Very good. Now let's let's end on this uh, note. Um, how do we measure the effectiveness of an electrical safety program uh, beyond the obvious uh, mitigation of, of incidents? Uh, what are some of the other few uh, key indicators for a, an effective electrical safety program? Well, one of the leading indicators that is talked about a lot, not just for electrical safety, but in occupational safety in general, as we were moving, trying to shift our culture more to a risk-based approach is measuring and monitoring how well are we doing in identifying opportunities to reduce risk? This is uh, leading indicators. An example could be uh, in audits or, or uh, design reviews. Uh, how often do we find opportunities to reduce risk? Uh, in, uh, in electrical incident investigations, say in close calls, near misses, where no one was hurt, but we could have had someone, are the uh, where do the recommendations lie? Are the recommendations focused on uh, reducing risk through engineering design changes to the system or equipment, or are they focused on more training and more PPE? And, and that 
more training and more PE does not necessarily get at the root cause of the, of the problem. The engineering design solutions are long lasting and uh, have much more effective in reducing risk than depending. No, I'm not saying that training and PPE is not important. They are very important, but they're, they're, they're vulnerable to human error in understanding, knowing, responding, doing the right thing every time, exactly right. Um, engineering design solutions, such as the metal enclosed switch gear I talked about, uh, the double insulated tools I talked about, the GFCIs that I talked about, the touch safe fuse block, I talk, those, those are examples of engineering design solutions that takes the risk out of the hands of the worker uh, and they're built into the design of the, of the equipment. So you do, you're not depending on that worker to have to be safe uh, all the time. Okay. Very good. Well, Ed, that's great, Lanny. Again, our thanks uh, to Lanny Floyd for once again sharing his, his tremendous expertise on the area of arc flash and electrical safety. And, and now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. So please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our webcast. So on behalf of Lanny Floyd and on behalf of Plant Engineering, I'm Bob Avra. Thanks for attending our webcast this afternoon. Thanks and have a wonderful afternoon.